are at the Sierra Nevada Forums event on Yucca Mountain 101 tonight. If you are not familiar with Sierra Nevada Forums, we are a rather unorganized group of volunteers that decide on topics we think you all might hear about, and then we go ahead and try to pull them together as best as we can on many pots of coffee and figure out what we think it should look like. And we started this in 2012 with the Healthcare Act, and it was so well received at that point in time that we decided we were on a real roll and, and have kept going ever since then. So, and I guess it's time to do the healthcare again, isn't it? Yeah. Feel my pain. I know. So, at any rate, I want to welcome all of you tonight. How many of you are here at a Sierra Nevada Forum for the first time? Oh, quite a few of you. So, it was this topic that probably drew, drew you here. Good. Okay. We are a free event. We do this on purpose because we want everybody to be able to attend. We do accept donations, and we're very appreciative of those. We do have a grant that Partnership Carson City wrote for uh, Nevada Humanities to act as our PCC has to be our fiscal agent because we, like I say, are just a loosey group of people. And um, they've, they've gotten a grant for us to help pay for this facility and for the videotaping. This event um, is videotaped, so if you know people that were unable to attend tonight, Give Darla a couple weeks and she will have this forum's tape uh, loaded onto our Sierra Nevada Forum's website. Or if you would like to revisit it, um, you're welcome to do that. You'll have a vehicle to do that. Okay, where am I at here? Um, our sponsors are Partnership Carson City and the Nevada Humanities. Important question, but I'm really glad a lot of you avoided those middle seats because we don't take bathroom breaks here. We go straight through and the restrooms are out the door and to your, my left, you're allowed to when you go that way. So that's why a lot of these middle seats, they all empty. You guys know about that. Our next forum is going to be 11-14, November 14th, Tuesday night, same time, 6 to 8. It's going to be on community sustainability. We have three very prestigious speakers who will be talking about energy efficiency, waste recycling, and urban agriculture. And we also have um, a, a nationally known specialist who's going to talk about how you can't do sustainability in a little pods. You can't say we're going to do energy now, then we're going to do food later, then we're going to do this. Systemically, it all has to come together. It all has to be built together. So it should be a fascinating um, forum. We'd love to have you all attend. That gets us to tonight. Now, as you may notice, when you opened up your program, this fell out. This was your homework assignment. Did everybody read it? <laughs> Raise your hand if you did not read this. <laughs> okay. I will give you the cliff notes. We, when we set out to do the forum on Yucca Mountain, we thought that we could do it with all the multiple perspectives in one forum in 90 minutes. We soon came to realize that just the changes in science, in the increase in knowledge around science, the safety issues, the environmental issues, the political issues were much more complex than one forum could do. So we made the decision to take it into two, two chunks. The first piece would be really looking at where the state of Nevada's position is and where they came to that position, looking at it from a myriad of perspectives. That is what our speakers here tonight are going to be sharing with us. Then we have a second forum that we would like to plan and um, I'm going to leave it up to you guys. We can do a little hand vote right now if you want. But really looking at deeply into the part of people who would like to see this um, idea move forward and for what reasons. And again, looking at the science and the safety and the environmental economic issues. All those things that come into play when you start talking about nuclear energy. So uh, there's a lot of confusion out there, um, including me. People say, well, are we talking about, about a dump or a repository or a recycling center? All of that needs to be clarified because it's moved very, very fast and it's been difficult for people to keep up, me included. So does anybody need to read this little thing in here? <laughs> oh, well, what I found very interesting is we have quite a few of our rural counties. We have nine mineral and lander who really want to see the licensing process continue to go through. Um, and they're dramatically affected by this. And so we took into consideration things that they had to tell us. We also have uh, Jeff Doherty. You're here. Where are you? Could you stand up, please? Stand up. There you go. He, was, he gave a, a presentation in Fallon not too long ago that talked about what it would look like to move forward with the Mountain and the science and some of the, the statistics around that. 
So we'll be, we'll be probably hitting him up for some information as well. Um, but tonight we really want to focus on why Nevada is taking this, the position that they are, and then we will build from there. Now my question for you, this is a hand raiser kind of a thing. We can try to pull together the part two by maybe December, and Judy just fell out of her seat. Or we wait for, or, she, she, almost, she did, she almost passed over. <laughs> Do it as quickly as we can, or would it be more prudent to wait until we see um, if the National Regulatory Commission restarts the licensing process, um, or Congress changes their position on the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, and then have, with that information, see what all that looks like and what that means. And I'm kind of leaning towards the second one. How many would rather do it as quickly as, as possible? A few of you. How many would like to wait until we have the other information at hand? Okay. You can't put your hand twice. <laughs> You're with the deciders in here. You gotta. Because she's one of the ones that we drink coffee with and come up with these brilliant ideas. Now I'd like to draw your attention to tonight, and that would be our two speakers. And I would like to, to point out that their faces really don't look like these pictures. Anyway, we probably we couldn't make it any better. So we're just hoping you have something over. We're laughing, we're good. Okay, um, Robert Halstead, he is the Executive Director of the State of Nevada Agency for Nuclear Projects. And in consultation with the Governor and the Attorney General, he directs policy development for the Commission on Nuclear Projects and manages the work of Nevada's expert team in the Yucca Mountain licensing proceedings. He has worked with the State of Nevada since 1988. So you started with him. Yeah. He has authored, yes, yeah. Women jump by that black hair then. You know, like, women like gray hair. <laughs> He, was, he has authored or co-authored more than 40 publications on energy policy and impact assessment. And he advised the state of Wisconsin and the National Governors Association on legislation that re resulted in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 and the Nuclear Waste Project Amendments Act of 1987. So he's been going at this for quite some time. And we also have Marta. And Marta, at the present time, she is a Special Deputy Attorney General with responsibility for representing the Nevada Attorney General's Office and the Nevada Agency for Nuclear Projects in continuing efforts to block the proposed Yucca Mountain High-Level Nuclear Waste Repository. She also has authored uh, several papers on a variety of subjects relating to the environment and the proposed High-Level Nuclear Waste Repository at um, Yucca Mountain. And she has developed this in a 40-year career. So again, another child prodigy, I'm assuming, among us. So I was also going to make a special note that down here we have Alan Welch, who is a, uh, a former employee of the Geological Survey as a research hydrologist. So we have asked him to read the questions for us tonight because I would probably mispronounce half these words. And Bob, should I turn this over to you to begin with, or, or Marta? Okay. Uh, good evening. I want to begin by reading you a letter that we received in the office yesterday from a, uh, sounds like a real citizen who lives in Washington, D.C., but when a letter comes into our office from Washington, D.C., we don't exactly know what we're about to hear. But it begins, Dear Mr. Halstead, I've been looking into the situation regarding nuclear waste in our country and how we go about storing it. The more I read, the more concerned I become. I'm sure you share my concerns, considering the great threat nuclear waste poses, not just to some Americans, but to all of us. Well, I'm going to skip over the things that this writer had to say about uh, Senator Reid, and then I know this is still a controversial proposal, especially among Nevadans. I'm sure that's how this person would have pronounced it. But please, for the sake of the country and the people who live here, I implore you to do everything in your power to ensure that the repository at Yucca Mountain is approved and finished as soon as possible. There's a little more verbiage and it says, I look forward to your response. Now, I certainly share this writer's concern about the nuclear waste situation and also the way that it relates not just to immediate safety and environmental concerns, but to the future of nuclear power. 
But it's precisely because I know what's wrong with Yucca Mountain that I can say to you with no hesitation, Yucca Mountain is not the right answer. Now tonight, Marta and I plan to talk for about an hour. We've broken our discussion into three parts. So I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes on what's wrong with Yucca Mountain. Marta's going to talk for about the same amount of time on the legal issues, how the licensing process works in particular, because that's really the stage in the Yucca Mountain discussion that we're at now. Think of it as a science court process that might take five years. Then I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes at the end about some of the things that are happening in Washington, D.C., actually happening this week, some alternatives to Yucca Mountain, and a couple of topics that I know that there have been people in Nevada who have alternative views both on Yucca Mountain and nuclear power that they're interested in, in particular the issue of the processing of spent nuclear fuel. All right, I'd like to start with the conclusions by telling you what we think should be done before we tell you what's wrong with the current course of action. And the state of Nevada recommends that the nuclear waste program be restructured. And by the way, I'm going to talk mostly from my prepared remarks today so that I can stay on time. So I'm not actually going to read the content in the slides. The slides are available on our website. And uh, we brought some copies with us for after the meeting. So uh, <clears throat> again, Nevada recommends that the nuclear waste program be restructured according to the recommendations of the 2012 Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, which was a bipartisan uh, expert consensus group. The key recommendations are taking the program out of the Department of Energy and adopting a consent-based approach to selection of sites for storage and disposal. These changes cannot be successfully implemented unless Congress and the Department of Energy are prepared to walk away from Yucca Mountain, in our opinion. And we should note the Blue Ribbon Commission was specifically directed to take no position on and offer no opinions about Yucca Mountain. All right, let's start by reviewing. Uh, this is usually a problem for me when I talk to Easterners or professional societies where people think there's already a repository at Yucca Mountain ready to receive waste. That is, of course, not the case. There's a five-mile exploratory tunnel. There's nothing there that could be used to receive spent fuel for storage disposal or for, store, for surface storage or for disposal. And Congress has not appropriated any funds for DOE activities at Yucca Mountain since fiscal year 2011. In Nevada, opposition to Yucca Mountain in my opinion, has never been stronger, and I've been doing this for almost three decades in Nevada. Governor Sandoval said in the state of the state speech in January that he was pledging relentless opposition and maximum resources. Attorney General Adam Paul Laxalt and really most of the other top elected leaders in Nevada, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, conservatives, liberals, or independents, are opposed. And the majority of Nevadans polled in opinion surveys, uh, both in 2010 and 2017, which is the most recent data we have, posed Yucca Mountain. And then interestingly, when you add questions that measure the intensity of opinion, you find in the most recent statewide poll, 51% strongly opposed, 23% strongly in favor. <coughs> Now, the next two slides, we're going to talk a little about what high-level nuclear waste is. 90% of what would go to the repository would be spent fuel assemblies from commercial nuclear power plants. The other 10%, more or less, <coughs> excuse me, would be defense high-level radioactive waste, which comes primarily from nuclear weapons production. In some cases, it's been sitting in tanks almost since the Manhattan Project days and more recently from naval propulsion reactors. So the bad news about spent fuel is it is lethally radioactive. The good news is that the radiological hazards decline by two-thirds between 10 and 50 years after it's withdrawn from the reactor, and then by more than 90% between 10 and 100 years. And that's because the radionuclides, uh, cesium-137 and strontium-90, which are the primary radionuclides of concern for safety, uh, have half-lives of 30 years. So this is one of the few 
activities that humans can say procrastination, keeping it where it is before you move it, makes it a lot easier from the standpoint of the shielding that you have to put around it to protect the workers. Now, most of the commercial spec fuel uh, is in storage. All right. We were messing with these slides earlier, and my notes are not correct. So, we'll talk first about where most of the spent fuel is. It's stored in the eastern U.S. where most of the reactors are. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has said that it's safe there on site for up to 160 years in the of storage. Current practice in U.S. operating reactors is for spent fuel to go from the reactor core into a water-filled basin, some cases for as little as a couple years, in some cases as much as 10 years, then it's transferred to metal canisters and filled with an inert gas, welded or bolted shut, mostly welded now, and then placed inside vertical concrete casts or horizontal concrete structures like the ones that you see there on the right side of the slide. All right. In, uh, in 1982, federal government passed the first federal law dealing with nuclear waste disposal, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. And shortly thereafter, the Department of Energy identified nine potential sites in six states for the first repository, and then 12 potentially acceptable sites and 10 backups in 17 eastern and midwestern states. The idea was regional equity. And DOE also planned an interim storage facility in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, would have been right here. It actually was a very useful idea because the Oak Ridge facility was within a day's truck shipment of 90% of the spent fuel in the eastern U.S. But as we shall see, this plan quickly was changed. I apologize for all the fine print here, but sometimes when you're accusing people of doing bad things, it's useful to actually list their names so you can see who they are. So the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act, the third work on the second repository, terminated all the first round sites except Nevada. Why did that happen? DOE had selected Nevada, Texas, and Washington as the three finalists for the first repository. But then when Congress changed the law, they went into a smoke-filled room uh, in December of 87, and in those days, the smoke-filled rooms were actually filled with tobacco smoke. Texas was protected by Jim Wright, the Speaker of the House. Washington was protected by Tom Foley, the Majority Leader. The other uh, big congressional leaders had already weighed in, like uh, Senator Bennett Johnston of Louisiana, Chairman of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, he got his state off the hook. Uh, Senate Speaker Pro Tem John Stennis and House Minority Whip Trent Lott got Mississippi off the hook. Uh, senior Republican Senators from Utah, Jake Garner and Orrin Hatch, made sure Utah was off the hook. Uh, and the state that I was working for at the time, Wisconsin had the Dean of the Wisconsin Congressional Delegation, William Proxmire, who had been in Congress for 30 years and knew everybody and knew how to get things done. Nevada lacked a powerful voice in Congress. And that is why it is no exaggeration to say that Yucca Mountain was chosen on the basis of political science and not earth science. You might remember Senator Chick Heck, who was elected in 82, who replaced four-term incumbent Howard Cannon. Uh, poor Senator Heck is remembered for that comment he made about opposing a nuclear suppository. <laughs> Senator B, who has been elected, in 1986, replacing two-term incumbent Paul Laxalt. And uh, Barbara Bukanovich had been elected in 82. Uh, Jim Bilbray had been elected in 86. Nevada simply had no clout. And this was a situation where decisions were based on clout. Oh, and by the way, they decided to cancel that interim storage facility in Tennessee at the behest of Governor Lamar Alexander, who now finds himself as chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, where he thinks Yucca Mountain is a fine idea. Okay, so I've tried to summarize thousands of pages in DOE's license application and environmental impact statements into a few 
few paragraphs here. So if you look at the first period of Yucca Mountain, you mostly 50 years where transportation of waste occurs. Then we're talking about a pre-closure operations, probably at least 100 years, could even be 300 years. And then the post-closure performance, the regulations say this site has to work for a million years to protect groundwater. So if the licensing proceeding resumes, the data is fully prepared to adjudicate 218 contentions and challenges already admitted. We're preparing another 30 to 50 based on new information. We believe that that's going to take about 400 hearing days. And what that means in calendar days uh, or dog years, uh, it's a little hard to predict, but probably we're looking at at least four and possibly five years of the licensing proceeding. The cost is going to be expensive. DOE projected back at the beginning of this process that it would cost them about $1.66 billion with a B just to go through licensing. The NRC has just predicted $330 million as their cost for the regulatory work. And there must be something wrong with Nevada, but we think we can defend ourselves for $50 million. And it's partly because I think our contentions are really strong, our expert witnesses are very good. Now, I want to go through quickly the actual uh, lay of the contentions uh, and break them into categories for you. And then Marta is going to talk about the legal process for how these issues are resolved. The, the, the basic problem with Yucca Mountain is it's unlike any of the other sites in the world that are being considered for a repository. And that is, its geology and its hydrology are so complex that it's very difficult to predict future performance. And in this case, the Department of Energy chose a zone of fractured rock below and above a zone of fractured rock, which would allow highly corrosive water transport radioactive material from the waste packages into the water table that flows into Amargosa Valley. And our contentions admitted by the NRC licensing boards in May of 2009 challenge all of DOE's assumptions about the use of engineered barriers to make up for the deficiencies in the natural characteristics of the site. Geologic disposal is supposed to be geology keeps the radionuclides out of the biosphere. This is not the case at Yucca Mountain. And indeed, the Department of Energy was forced to acknowledge this, as we'll see in a couple of slides. So this is the Department of Energy's basic disposal concept. There would be um, you know, about 100 of these drifts that would look like this, where you basically <clears throat> have tunnels 26 feet in diameter, more or less, and you've got the waste packages here on skids, and then they're covered by these blue mailboxes, which are the infamous titanium drip shields. And here's a close-up on them. And this is one of the key weaknesses in DOE's design, because they propose to robotically install between 11 and 26,000 drip shields, one over each waste package, beginning 90 years after operations. And each drip shield would be 19 feet long, 8 feet wide, 9.5 feet high, weighing in at uh, 4.9 metric tons each. And the emplacement is going to cost a lot of money. If, in fact, it can be done, DOE estimates almost $8 billion, or almost 10% of the total cost of the repository going forward. So the questions we raise in our contentions are, will the NRC actually require them to be installed? Will Congress pay for them? <coughs> there are basic questions about the feasibility of fabricating them and installing them. And then if they're installed even, will they work? Another engineered barrier is a novel approach to thermal loading where DOE plans, says they can keep the temperature in the drifts where the waste is above the boiling point of water for a thousand years. That's 95 degrees Celsius or 203 degrees at Yucca Mountain because of the elevation. And then they argue they'll keep these pillar zones 
at least six to eight degrees Celsius cooler, and that this will keep the water away from the waste packages. Well, of course, no one's ever done anything like this before. We have some new conventions coming about groundwater. And the main thing I want to show you here is right about here is where the Timbush and Shoshone trust lands in Burns Creek. It uh, really says something that the NRC has not even put the Native American lands on their map showing where the flow of contaminants would end up going. Now, the, the final decision on Yucca Mountain, the key issue is going to be whether DOE's design can be proven by DOE to meet a groundwater protection standard promulgated by the Environmental Protection Agency and adopted by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that says for the first 10,000 years, whoop, this is very touchy. Forgive me, it's It's all based on this guy, who is presumed to drink two liters of water from a well near the repository. And the, the radiation protection <coughs> standard is designed to protect future generations for the first 10,000 years by limiting their additional radiation dose to 15 millirem per year, which is about a 4% increase in background levels. But then, for the remainder of the million year compliance period, <coughs> goes up six-fold to 100 millirem a year, or almost a third of what the background would be. Now, the NRC staff looked at DOE's calculations and they said, hey, no problems here for 200,000 years, and then we only, there will be contamination, but it'll only be a little bit. It'll only be a tenth of what's allowed. And we've looked at their assumptions, we've run the models with different assumptions, credible assumptions, and we conclude that it's possible that that 10,000 year standard is going to be violated as soon as 900 years, and that the million year standard could be exceeded in 2,000 years. So, that's going to be a key issue for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, I want to briefly say a few things about transportation before we turn this over to Mark. The, the most important thing to remember is that shipments to Yucca Mountain would be very different than past shipments in the United States. The amount shipped every year would be almost as much as the total shipped in the last 40 years. And the shipment characteristics that are important for safety would be dramatically different. Now, the safety record of past shipments is relatively good, but it's simply not good enough going forward on this scale. And in particular, the new casks that DOE proposes to use will need to be tested full scale to ensure that they meet the NRC safety standards for performance in severe accidents. And by the way, none of the casts currently used in the United States have ever been tested full scale, uh, which is unlike the situation in Germany and the United Kingdom. Now, I'm just going to go quickly through the uh, transportation contentions. There are 16 of them, but they cover all the transportation issues. So first of all, we're not sure if DOE has accurately mapped the routes that would be used for these shipments, nor do we believe they have actually <coughs> excuse me, demonstrated that they can move 95% of the waste by rail. That's important because even moving 95% of the waste by rail, they still have 5,000 truck shipments, which is one or two truck shipments every week, every week for 50 years. So a second set of contentions deals with whether DOE has adequately assessed how the cast will perform in severe accidents, particularly where you have long duration high temperature fires. And we've also <clears throat> looked at the issue of human initiated events, human errors, industrial sabotage, and actual terrorism attacks using armor piercing weapons. We also look specifically at the impacts in Las Vegas. Uh, for all the uh, effort that DOE did in planning their transportation system, they still have a system that's going to move between 5,000 and 11,700 shipments over 50 years, at least 48% of those shipments on the truck routes go to Las Vegas. It's possible that 85% of all the shipments will end up going to Las Vegas. Now, in particular, we identify 
what's called the region of influence for routine radiation, which is 800 meters or one half mile on each side of the cask. And you can see that catches most of the Las Vegas Strip, which means that there are some well-known properties that you might have heard of that are right in there in the routine radiation zone. The Caliente Railroad is another part of this problem. It would come off of the main line between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles, which goes through Las Vegas, and go up this way around the test site. So it will be the, the largest new railroad project in the country in 100 years. Uh, the problem is, it's the, about the worst possible way that you can pick to get to Yucca Mountain, and why was that done? It was done because the Department of Energy wanted to buy friends in Lincoln County by starting the railroad at Caliente, which as many of you know is an old railroad town. Now, among the challenges here are going east-west against four north-south trending mountain ranges, numerous surface flood areas. There are uh, areas here where you have lots of cuts and fills. You actually have to go up through this pass from the White River to the mountain area. There are land use conflicts here in Golden Gate and the Gravely Valley. And frankly, there are some limited economic benefits. They all go to the city of Caliente under DOE's plan. Finally, one obstacle DOE should have found, but remarkably did not find until late in the process, was that the place they had chosen to go from Coal Valley to Garden Valley, basically to go around the test site, put them to a place where they had never ground-proofed their aerial surveys. And it turns out that 30 years ago, this guy, Michael Heiser, world-renowned land sculptor, had picked this valley in Garden Valley because it was so far away. He said, nobody will know what I'm doing. It's going to take me 30 years to build a giant sculpture a mile by a mile and a half that replicates what a city of the future 3,000 years from now would look like if it had been built 1,000 years from now, and then it was in ruins. It's a pretty cool idea because he uses the whole valley as part of the sculpture. And believe me, I'm not exaggerating. Now, I went through there myself in 1991 when the site was, when the route was first put out, and I didn't go as close as I should have. I looked two miles down from the road and said, gee, that looks like another illegal gold mining operation. I'm going to have to talk to NDEP when I get back to Carson City. But this whole proposal for a $3 billion railroad should never have gone forward. Because when we actually look at the way this is planned, this is one of the computer outputs we're going to use in court to show that DOE completely failed to look at city here and the way their preferred rail line here would affect the entire East Show of Garden Valley. Well, these are just a few of the things that are wrong with the Upper Mountain. I'm going to turn this over to Marta now and we'll talk about some of the legal remedies that the state of Nevada has pursued. I think the good news, at least for those of us who share our point of view on this, is we've never really stopped preparing for this. We've always been an underdog and we've always been mindful that the, the headway and the progress we've made has involved a commitment of resources to the extent we've been able to. There's an aerial view of Yucca Mountain itself. It's a geologically tough material, which is known as a fragment of rock. My mountain climbing son would call it trash rock because it is so fragmented and certainly doesn't intuitively lend itself to the geologic stability that we believe the original Communities Policy Act provided for. We need to move the microphone. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, this is a view of Yucca Mountain. It pretty much shows what it looks like. In the past, before the Yucca Mountain Project ran out of money and uh, both DOE and NRC shut the project down, the Department of Energy conducted tours of the horseshoe-shaped exploratory tunnel that Mr. Halstead talked about. Anyway, this uh, picture was taken at the time when tours were being conducted. 
and it gives you an idea there is a rail line that takes a person into the mountain and, and you can actually view the inside of the mountain. Here's a pictorial representation of the um, The red um, is the horseshoe-shaped tunnel that exists at Yucca Mountain. So when people try to say all this investment has been made in this, they seem to misunderstand that no part of this would represent the repository. In fact, an additional 41 miles of emplacement drifts or tunnels would be required to meet the in inventory requirements currently uh, uh, contained in the law. Now, uh, Bob Halstead's going to introduce you to the idea of what is pending in Congress in terms of changing it. But this does show that the exploratory tunnel, again, is somewhat like a horseshoe, and then 41 additional miles of tunnels would be required, ultimately, to construct this repository. There is no repository at Yucca Mountain. Originally, uh, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, of course, as amended, uh, the Department of Energy did uh, legally withdraw both the land area of the Yucca Mountain proposed site as well as the Caliente Rail Corridor. Um, this uh, uh, map here shows how Yucca Mountain was originally conceived and the actual area that would be required to construct this facility. Part of it was the Nevada Test and Training Range, the Nevada Test Site, which has been renamed, and uh, Bureau of Land Management land is the majority part of this area, as well as Nellis Air Force Base. Incidentally, this withdrawal was allowed to expire in January 2010. This slide shows the groundwater flow pattern of the underneath the Yucca Mountain Repository, which is unique from the standpoint of being above the water table. And internationally, that's considered a very risky proposition because when you have a breach of a, a canister, there's an immediate opportunity for the radionuclides to uh, be released off site. So uh, you can see, and this is uh, mirroring, mirroring what uh, Bob discussed, you can see the proximity of Death Valley. The Amargosa Valley is very close to the site. Uh, it, that is an active uh, agricultural area. Uh, Amargosa Desert's below Death Valley. Again, the Funeral Mountains, which is the Timisha Shoshone site. This slide, and again, it's not the greatest, but it does illustrate how seismically active the Yuck Mountain is. This is roughly a 150-year period, and you can see the um, level of activity seismically that is a very characteristic of the site. This is a pretty good slide. What it actually shows is DOE's version of a man falling off the crest of the Yucca Mountain. And for, I know for quite some time there was some discussion of what symbology would be appropriate to basically trigger concern for future generations because of the long-lived requirements of this dangerous substance. Now this, is, this was what really impressed me the first time I was out on the site. There are act actually very youthful volcanoes in close proximity to Yucca Mountain. This picture shows on the map where Yucca Mountain is and these two relatively young volcanoes. And they definitely look like volcanoes. That's what they are. So uh, Bob mentioned we had a, a system set in place in 1982 that basically contains much of the framework framework of citing a geologic repository and addressing waste issues. 
part of that scheme was this iterative comparative process to look at a variety of sites to determine the best site, uh, the geologic features of the site. Um, in 1987, the question really changed. It went from, is Becca Mountain a safe and suitable site to cite the nation's first geologic repository to how do we make this work in spite of the flaws in the site? And that's, that's where many in Nevada became essentially mad. The, the whole idea of the populist resistance to being singled out has become a much more uh, substantial, critically technical case against the siting of the repository here. So, now the, the site itself has a variety of infirmities. And, and again, as mentioned by Bob, um, the water flowing under the mountain is highly corrosive and it's an oxidizing environment. There's fast groundwater pathways through it. Again, high earthquake activity, young volcanic activity. We've got ground stretching uh, phenomena, including mag magma near the surface. Uh, it's susceptible to air aircraft accidents being very close to the bombing range and Nellis Air Force Base. There's no rail access at the moment and the site itself is far distant from the majority of the waste. The NRC uh, was set up to be a bipartisan, independent regulatory body. It uh, essentially came into being in uh, 1954, but uh, it took until 1982, nearly 30 years later, to come up with a scheme for uh, recognizing the necessity of the geologic repository and, and uh, getting a path forward. Of course, now we're coming up on 40 years where we don't have a permanent repository and we have a greatly flawed process. So just running through this somewhat quickly, uh, the Department of Energy in 2008, at the tail end of the George W. Bush administration, did file what we considered a greatly flawed license application, uh, which was docketed, which is accepted for consideration by the NRC. Um, we did proceed for, for a time, for a couple of years, with uh, preliminary procedural matters in licensing. And then finally the NRC in 2011 suspended the NRC licensing because of lack of funds. Basically Congress has not appropriated the funds for Yucca Mountain since 2011. Um, finally in August 2013, uh, the District of Columbia Circuit Court of Appeals did uh, order the NRC to restart licensing because there remained roughly $14 million for NRC to proceed to allow Congress an opportunity to either fund the pro project or to go forward. And actually neither happened, and the NRC has done pre-adjudicatory uh, activities in compliance with the court order. Uh, essentially, its staff uh, prepared a five-volume uh, what they call the safety evaluation report. NRC, rather than DOE, uh, performed a supplement to the groundwater analysis and a supplement to an EIS prepared by DOE and has essentially spent out its funds. Um, and finally, the NRC, in, in compliance with the court order, did uh, reactivate its uh, what they call the licensing support network network uh, database, which is to contain all the critical documents, uh, essentially, which constitute the record as it stands now. And I realize some of this is a little esoteric, and I apologize for that. I'm just trying to run through the requirements. So um, the legally mandated licensing proceeding, at least until Congress changes the law, includes a variety of features. 
yeah, uh, licensing would involve a trial type setting with full discovery. Uh, at present, there are 299 contentions, 218 of which are belong to the state of Nevada, and I'll run through the gamut that we consider there. We are also working on 30 to 50 contentions, basically uh, uh, following the issuance of the supplement on groundwater. We believe there's that document raised serious issues. Now again, and um, Sir Halstead went into this, um, DOE some time ago estimated the cost just of licensing, not constructing this facility, would be roughly $1.66 billion. NRC, the uh, adjudicatory body, estimated a mere $330 million. And then Nevada, again, were, were uh, lean and hopefully effective at a mere 40 to 50 million. So just to um, hopefully not bore you to tears, but I want to run through the part participants in the proceeding. So again, the license applicant is the Department of Energy, uh, the applicant for the project, and uh, uh, basically the promoter and the implementer of it. The NRC staff, which is the staff to the adjudicatory body, the commission, once uh, an application is docketed, uh, becomes essentially a party to the um, adjudicatory proceeding. Interveners include the state of Nevada, who oppose, or in some cases, as, as is the case with the Nuclear Energy Institute, support the application. Uh, the five-member bipartisan commission, the NRC, generally delegates the initial adjudicatory function to what they call the Atomic Safety and Licensing Boards, and they're the initial administrative law judges. Normally a panel consists of three judges who consider the uh, various contentions. And then finally, once there's a final agency decision, that's when aggrieved participants are in a, have an opportunity to file an administrative appeal and go to court. So roughly, and again Bob touched on uh, some of this, uh, Nevada's case against DOE's license application can be broken down into four different um, subject matters. There's the post-closure safety, and that's really the long-term consideration. That's one million year period that both the National Academy of Sciences and um, uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit has determined that that's the amount of time required to protect the public, the accessible human and natural environment from the dangers of spent nuclear fuel. There's the pre-closure safety period, which is roughly 300 years, which is essentially before the, the repository is closed. And that evaluates conditions uh, relating to surface facilities and the vulnerability of the project to human and uh, natural disasters. There's transportation impacts. And before Bob was uh, director of our program was probably one of the foremost uh, transportation experts in this field and knows all about it. So if you have any questions on that. Um, transportation impacts are roughly 50 to 100 years because this material is not going to magically get beamed to Yucca Mountain. It's going to have to be staged and it takes quite some time to get this material way out west. Okay, and then finally, we have, have a variety of uh, National Environmental Policy Act claims which are adjudicable or uh, become judici judiciable once you've got a record of decision. Uh, these run the gamut. A lot of it has to do with process and consideration of the various alternatives that this project presents. So uh, very quickly, um, Nevada again has 218 contentions right now and, and quite a few prospective contentions should the adjudication go forward. They run the gamut from climatic, future conditions, water flow models, installation of drip shields, 
chemical composition of infiltrating water, corrosion and failure of the drip shields, and again, whether they're installed or not remains a question. Uh, failure of the waste packages, the issue of sorption of radionuclides into the minerals themselves, behavior of radionuclides once it, is, it reaches the biosphere, military aircraft crashes into surface facilities, future volcanic events, and tra transportation risks. So there are quite a few uh, concerns. Um, there is, and it's certainly worth mentioning, uh, quite a persuasive business case against Yucca Mountain. Uh, um, the license itself, again, is going to cost the rate payers and the taxpayers roughly $2 billion. The repository to date has already cost the government, and again, rate payers, uh, roughly $15 billion, but actually constructing the up amount mountain because of the complexity of the site is likely to cost another 80 billion. So terminating Yucca Mountain and developing another more appropriate stable site could save roughly 12 to 27 billion dollars. Now Bob also mentioned uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission. It did issue its, and again it was bipartisan, it was chaired by Brent Scowcroft and Lee Hamilton, two Two names they probably heard. They did come up with uh, a, record, a set of recommendations which hopefully will become embodied in a more sane legislative path forward for dealing with the country's nuclear waste. Um, a finding, among other things, was that the National Nuclear Waste Disposal Program, program is broken. A key finding was that consent-based siting of an appropriate site would involve both the locals, affected Indian tribes, and from our point of view, the most important, the state of Nevada, or any state wherever a site uh, has the requisite geologic features. Um, the Repo uh, Blue Ribbon Commission also recommended interim storage facilities be de uh, developed We've got two potential sites on the books now. We'd like to see those move forward. Uh, again, uh, DOE, because of all the problems they've had, certainly for the last 30 plus years, point to a need to have a new agency or a federally chartered corporation. Uh, certainly, we'd like to see the National Academy of Sciences adapt, adopt the two, 2006 transportation recommendations and then follow the, what is considered successful consultation project that was used for the WIP facility in New Mexico. And that involved close collaboration and consultation between the Department of Energy and the state of New Mexico. Finally, and I'll just run through these really quickly, we uh, certainly haven't left many stones unturned. We do have five pending cases challenging various aspects of this project. Real quickly, we're, the state of Nevada is challenging the EPA radiation protection standard. We're challenging the NRC licensing rule, which incorporates the EPA radiation protection standard. We're challenging the de uh, designation of the Caliente Rail Corridor. Uh, and again, for the uh, reasons Bob mentioned, uh, there's, there's many infirmities with this uh, rail corridor, not the least of which is the recent uh, creation of the Basin and Range National Monument. Finally, we've got, uh, actually there's two cases, water cases. The state of Nevada denied water to the Department of Energy to construct and operate the repository. That case is sitting in the district court in Las Vegas. And then finally, the state has intervened in a case brought by the state of Texas uh, on what I would argue are some spurious grounds. The state of Texas uh, challenged a consent-based process that the Department of Energy engaged in, and then also challenged NRC's activities when they were ordered back into licensing. So, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to wrap up now. I'm going to try to cover 21 slides.
slides in about 12 minutes just to give you an overview of things that you might want to ask questions about. And the first thing is policy of legislation. Here we see so 30 years from the time that the National Academy of Sciences said we need a geologic disposal is the best way of dealing with high level waste. Uh, through actually getting to a decision from 87, where there was a strong direction for the Department of Energy to proceed. I think they made an error on the site selection, but it tells you something about how long and contentious this is. An enormous number of political careers, for example, many of you have heard, I'm sure, Senator Bob Dole, a major part of his career in the early 1970s was made kicking the federal government and their waste program out of the state of Kansas. And that unfortunately had an impact on the decision in 87 when the Congress said, you know what, we're going to just have to force this down somebody's throat. The case was made that Yucca Mountain was maybe not the best site, but it wasn't the worst site. And this is how we find ourselves in the situation we are today. The 2012 Blue Ribbon Commission report, there's the cover there, and again, Marta and I have both talked about it. Um, I think the bottom line is most people who are familiar with the business think that this is a pretty good report summarizing all the issues associated with nuclear power and also the role of the United States in the world frankly being in danger of losing its leadership role in the area of nuclear technology. So I urge all of you who are interested in this topic to read that report. It's not just about nuclear waste. And then of course, complicating things for us in Havana, uh, this great report came out, but they had been told to be silent about the other mountain. So here's where we find ourselves today. There are basically three pieces of legislation either under consideration or about to be under consideration um, in Washington. First, Nevada's delegation has legislation S95 and HR 456 uh, in the House and the Senate basically to apply the Blue Ribbon recommendation to the state of Nevada and the Upper Mountain. It's a very reasonable proposal that says continue the licensing proceeding, do your fact finding, but before the Secretary of Energy can spend any of that money that's in the nuclear waste fund, they have to have a signed agreement from the governor of the host state, the governing body of the host county, which in this case would be the Nine County Commission, any affected Indian tribes, and any of the counties that you're going to move waste through that are around the host county. That, of course, is, is in the law or the proposed in the bill to either make the Department of Energy keep the shipments out of Clark County or understand that Clark County would have the right to veto the agreement. A second bill uh, that we expect to come up is actually a bill that's been introduced uh, twice in the last four years, the Nuclear Waste Administration Act. This is the so-called Gang of Four bill after uh, Alexander Murkowski, Murkowski, Feinstein, and Cantwell, who are the ranking Democrats and, and the uh, uh, chairpersons on the Republican side of the uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the Appropriations Subcommittee that governs the funding for them. Basically, this would implement the Blue Ribbon Commission with the exception that instead of taking the program out of DOE and putting it in a federal corporation, would take it out uh, and put it into an independent federal agency. Uh, someone wants to ask me an explanation about why Lamar Alexander, the distinguished senator and former governor of Tennessee, uh, has this real dislike for the Tennessee Valley Authority. And one person has basically overruled the, the uh, option of going to a federal corporation, which frankly is what's not only endorsed by uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission, but the Nuclear Energy Institute and most people in the nuclear industry. Again, this is a, a bill that skirts Yucca Mountain, it basically is silent on Yucca Mountain, which means it transfers all of the Yucca Mountain responsibilities. We expect this to be introduced sometime in the next two months. Now, many of you might have heard about this recently. Representative Shimkus is probably the uh, most uh, committed pro-Yucca person in Congress. He's the uh, chairman of the 
uh, Environment Subcommittee of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee in the House, which is the committee of jurisdiction. Uh, this bill is just the opposite of the approach in the Senate. The Senate is a holistic approach that says this program has many, many problems, seven or eight major ones, of which you have to map is only one. The approach in the House is there is only one problem. Nevada's opposition to get them out. So this bill is a combination of sticks and stones and carrots. It attempts to expedite the licensing proceeding. And as you'll probably hear next week, because uh, we understand that Representative Shimkus is coming to Reno to talk to the Chamber of Commerce next week to tell us about all the wonderful benefits in the way of financing that his bill will bring. Uh, we certainly expect this bill, because it got 49 votes in committee. We expect it to pass on the House floor. Probably will be brought up in two weeks. But I also believe it's dead on arrival in the Senate. Finally, there's the matter of money, which actually is the most immediate issue, because there is a law in place that would require the Department of Energy to go forward with the other mountain. And there's a law that requires the NRC to as a regulatory body, consider the license application, but there's no money. So, um, there's no money in the current continuing resolution, which is how the government stays funded because they couldn't pass appropriations bills by October 1st. But in the summer, the House passed a bill that provided $150 million for mostly Yucca Mountain by our count, about $10 million of that dollar, about $10 million of that is for interim storage, and all the rest is for Yucca Mountain. On the other hand, the Senate voted no money for Yucca Mountain, and by a 30 to 1 vote, which means they're only 21 votes short of what they need to pass it on the House floor and in opposition to funding for Yucca Mountain. So we're going into December when the current uh, continuing resolution will expire. We'll go through that whole game of will the government going to shut down on January 1st or so. Yeah, Marty, do you know what day it is? Days actually before the first of the current resolution expires. But, but they certainly have to act by the middle of December, and that's what we'll be watching. Now, let me go through a couple of quick alternatives. Uh, interim storage basically puts a step between storage of the reactors and the repository. Uh, other things could be done at an interim storage facility, but the main thing is waste that was packaged for transportation and storage at the reactors would have a place to go while the repository business is all figured out. And there are actually two uh, sites here very close to one another in Texas and New Mexico Two experienced nuclear companies, uh, Holtec and Ariba, uh, have license applications into the NRC, um, and they actually could be in operation, uh, I believe, in, in four to five years. Uh, because the licensing involves systems, the hardware has already been approved by the NRC for use at reactors, so this should move pretty quickly once it gets going. A big issue will be whether the utilities can ship their fuel to their own storage. As some of you may know, down in San Diego, where the San Onofre reactors have shut down, this is a very big issue in the local community. So there's a lot of pressure to have their own storage. Now, what other types of places might be better for geologic disposal? The original plan uh, in the United States was salt beds or salt domes. There were a number of sites. This is where the lift facility in salt is. And there were salt sites in Utah and in Texas. But there even have been salt sites that have been considered in Michigan uh, and, and down along the Gulf of Coast. So there are lots of places in this country where we have salt. And we know from the waste isolation pilot plant that while there have been some pretty stupid human errors that have uh, cost DOE about $2 billion, to uh, undo those human errors, basically know how to construct an underground repository in salt. Uh, I started work on this project in 1979, looking at uh, these sites in Wisconsin, where uh, particularly the Wolf River Bacalin. This is the uh, Wolf River phase of the Wolf River Bacalin. This was seen 
by the geologists in Wisconsin as probably the best site in the country. And that was part of the concern that got Wisconsin involved in 87 because of a distrust of the Department of Energy. And in, in part of the work that was done, the Canadians have been looking at almost identical types of granite, uh, particularly at the uh, underground research laboratory at Pinawan, Manitoba. And indeed, we now see, uh, this is taken from, two, from 2015, so the design has changed a little. But the fins are actually very far along successfully constructing a repository of crystalline rock. Um, clay and shale formations. This is the rock, uh, host rock of choice in France, which started out looking at crystalline rock. Um, and uh, this is also being explored in Switzerland and Belgium. It's kind of the new hot thing in international research on geologic disposal. Now, many people who study nuclear waste are interested in reprocessing, and all I can do is give you a very quick overview. But I want to call to your attention, if you go online, look for the World Nuclear Association. Look, they're very pro-nuclear, but they're also very good on the facts. They're the people who told the industry an accident anywhere is an accident everywhere. So everybody in the industry has to mind their keys and cues. So I have no problem recommending to you the World Nuclear Association website. There's an updated article from November of 2016 entitled Processing of Used Nuclear Fuel. It has a really good overview of the past of reprocessing in the United States, the current major reprocessing operation. Obviously, the best well known is France, but actually the uh, United Kingdom also has a very robust reprocessing program. Uh, and they also talk about the new developments in reprocessing, in particular the technique that's called pyroprocessing. So I'm just going to quickly show you that the, the whole French uh, program is built around standardized reactor designs, standardized fuel designs, and uh, the, the use and reuse of what's called NOx, mixed oxide fuel, which means mixed uranium and plutonium fuel. And uh, this reprocessing is done at a very big, very well-known industrial complex at Le Havre in the channel. And uh, the steps, again, this is in our website uh, listing of the handout, and we've got some copies with us. Um, essentially, everybody in the reprocessing business to date at the commercial scale has used some variation of what's called the Purex process, which basically involves uh, bringing the fuel to a central location, chopping it up, separating the metal components uh, using highly concentrated nitric acid to dissolve the fuel, separating the plutonium and the uranium, but not producing a pure stream of plutonium for proliferation concerns, uh, and then shipping out the rest of the waste, either as a low-level waste or non-radioactive waste. Um, while we mentioned France and England uh, don't really know much about the Russian program. Chinese appear to be on the verge of starting the program. Japanese had a very ambitious project. Uh, we're not sure now because of the state of the Japanese industry where that will go. Uh, it's actually a very innovative program in India for different types of fuel. The UK has been, uh, LWR means light water reactor. Those are pressurized water reactors, boiling water reactors, kind of reactors we use in the US. They use some different reactor designs in other countries. And um, what can we say about the pros and cons? The people who support reprocessing uh, argue that fuel recovery allows you to reuse the uranium and especially the plutonium in uh, advanced generate, what are called generation four reactors. Also produces beneficial use isotopes in a whole range of non-reactor uses reduces significantly the volume, the hazard, and the cost of getting rid of the, the most dangerous portion of the waste, what we call waste requiring geologic disposal as a general category. And there are national security arguments in favor of reprocessing, if only because 
It's a deep concern that the Russians and the Chinese, and now perhaps the Koreans and the Indians, would become the world leaders in developing this technology. Now, on the con side, the big problem with reprocessing right now is cost. You're talking 10 to 20 billion dollars for these start reprocessing in the United States. And then the problem is the fuel that's produced is so expensive, if you try to recover the cost, it can't compete with the fresh fuel from terrestrial mines. And the new big thing in uranium is extraction from seawater. Five years from now, that might be economically viable. The process hazards and environmental impacts. Look, I know both sides of this debate. I'm a member of the American Nuclear Society. I'm not an anti-nuclear person. I keep my personal views out of what I do for the state. But I will tell you, everywhere that reprocessing has been done on a large scale, France, England, Hanford, Washington, Idaho Falls, Idaho, Savannah River, South Carolina, West Valley, New York, it has, it has resulted in terrible environmental contamination and cleanup costs at Hanford alone, it might be a quarter of a trillion. Yes, $250 billion. So the people who want to promote reprocessing have got to deal with this task. Finally, while you do reduce the, the, the worst radiological hazard, you get about a six-fold increase in the amount of low level of intermediate waste. And then, of course, there is this problem of weapons proliferation. Um, Last slide, there are pros and cons about reprocessing, but I, I've looked at this very closely for the better part of 15 years. There's just no good case for reprocessing in the vicinity around the Yucca Mountain. Transportation issues, water issues, not just for reprocessing. If you do pyro processing, you don't need the water. But why would you locate your reprocessing facility some distance from a fuel fabrication facility? And you need a lot of water for the fuel fabrication operations. Seismic hazards, I don't think you can get an NRC license anywhere within 100 miles of Yucca Mountain for a reprocessing facility. But oh, look, the, uh, probably the most important issue is this. In 2005, when DOE said we're interested in restarting reprocessing, who did they hear from? They heard from all those facilities, Savannah River, Hanford, Idaho, and some others who met the functional criteria. I don't think a Nevada application would even get serious consideration because of the preference that would go to those communities that have an experienced workforce that actually work in reprocessing. Anyway, it's going to be an open debate. I expect the reprocessing issue to come up. And frankly, the possibility of future reprocessing is one reason to really step back and look at the whole commitment we've made to early geologic disposal. Maybe the smartest thing is to keep the spent fuel at the reactors for, for 10 to 20 or 30 years until the, at least one half life of the cesium-137 decays. Then keep it in interim storage and keep open all the options for future reprocessing. Thank you. Uh, you've been a great audience and you've let us talk way too long. Um, first one, does the federal government fund uh, the Rada Agency for Nuclear Projects? Not since what, 20, uh, 2010? Not since 2010. Uh, we had some federal funding. I think we have a couple hundred thousand dollars or less left, but um, we are supported by the Nevada legislature, and so we have state funding, and in the current biennium, uh, we have uh, $3.6 million between our two agencies uh, per year, so it's you know, uh, $7.2 million over that time. And, uh, Basically, we have learned to live without federal funding. There were times when uh, our two agencies together were spending in the eight, nine, I don't think we ever got up to 10 million, but we're in the eight to nine million dollar range in the beginning of the licensing proceeding, and about half of those funds. And if you look over the last, basically the way to understand this is since 2002, all of the data's costs have been about $50 million dollars over 15 years, and about half of that came from federal funding. But we currently receive no federal funding. That's um, uh, true or false, um, sort of rumors, if you will, 
Uh, high level waste goes by rail through Reno. It was San Francisco. Not that I not that I know of. No, there was there was a rail shipment some years ago that came from Concord, California to Idaho. And it, I believe it took the Feather River Canyon route to, to avoid, you know, but to my knowledge there there aren't any. It is one of the things that um, if you look at the provisions of uh, Representative Shipkus's bill, now I don't believe he's delivering on this, but he's put a provision in there that he says will wrap, will keep the shipments out of Clark County. And the irony of that is that would then, if you look at the 76 shipping sites and the rail connections, that would put those rail shipments that would go through Las Vegas. In fact, there'd be twice as many shipments through Reno and Sparks. As, as there would be through Las Vegas under that proposal. But it's, like I said, it's a long, that's a long ways from becoming law even if it passes the House of Representatives. Okay, um, again, true or false, lower mid-level waste is stored in Yucca Mountain. No. Nope. And low-level waste is stored above ground in B. No. Low level. But not above ground. Did you say up there? Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. No, there, there is an old site yes. at right. a low level waste, and you may have heard about the the um, explosion that occurred when some improperly labeled and disposed of barrels of uh, elemental sodium in kerosene had been put there years ago. The kerosene which buffers them leaked away and then one bad rain event got water in there and it, it caused an explosive reaction. Uh, fortunately, no radioactive material was released. But that that is the situation with baiting. So the state took possession of the site in 1991 or 92. And so the state is responsible for its perpetual care. Um, and. Uh, it remains to be seen what the full implications of that uh, that explosive event will be. But there's nothing above ground, and there's nothing that's gone there for uh, almost 30 years. There is low-level waste going to a facility called uh, Area 5 at the Nevada Nuclear Security Site, and that's where um, Gosh, in some years, 1,500 to 1,800 trucks may come in. But that's a very different type of waste that, than we're talking about in the Yucca Mountain. And it all comes from Department of Energy cleanups, not from commercial sites. Uh, why did San Onofre close down? <laughs> uh, I, I just, you know, this is a strictly personal opinion. Uh, I do not know, looking at the case, how it is that the utility and the nuclear equipment suppliers decided that the preferred choice was to, was to shut that site down. Um, I'm very familiar with problems with steam generators on pressurized water reactors. That was one of the things I dealt with in the state of Wisconsin. And, um, well, I think public opposition, but I, I just, you know, they, they claim that it was too expensive to keep those reactors, to bring those reactors back in operation. And I think it's going to go, through, it's going to go to court eventually, right? Okay, I think you touched on this uh, towards the end. Um, where are the interim storage facilities? Okay. Um, as I think Bob, uh, one of his last slides deal with the two proposals, again, close in uh, distance. Uh, one is that in sort of an extension of the Carlsbad facility in New Mexico, and the other's in Andrews County, Texas. Um, but interim storage often is above ground. Uh, you know, part of the concern is Certainly, we would support it because it would relieve some of the issues at a place like San Onofre next to the ocean. 
but uh, the concern is that if there's not a permanent repository on the table, then, you know, obviously there's concern that a temporary doesn't want to become a de facto permanent. And, and certainly the tortured history of nuclear waste is not positive in, in the United States. I've done quite a bit of research on that. Um, you, you touched on this as well. It's, uh, it's been 30 years. Where are the spent rods being stored now? Well, largely uh, on reactor sites, and, and certainly there's orphaned uh, waste in places like Vermont, where the repository's been shut down. And, uh, you know, Bob certainly knows, yeah. right, the reactors are shut down. Uh, there's one up in Oregon, too. Um, the, the waste needs to be dealt with. I, I was always taught that uh, actually the waste itself cannot be moved for five years after going through a, a fuel generating cycle. It needs to have the shielding and the, the tank-like structure on one of Bob's slides. And then it can go into uh, dry cast storage. That's those uh, concrete looking silos. Which the NRC, supposedly the protector of public health and safety, says that they're safe up to 160 years. Do you know who originally suggested Dr. Mountain as a viable site? It's a really good question. I've been um, when we're going to bring some books. I mean, there 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 is a terrific large two-volume book written by Michael Vogel uh, called The Waste of a Mountain. I don't agree with a lot of the things that Michael says there, but this is like a thousand pages and two big volumes. Yeah, it costs about a hundred dollars, but all the proceeds are going to the uh, museum in Corump that's dedicated to nuclear events. And there's a terrific discussion in uh, Michael's book about how Yucca Mountain came to be looked at. And uh, it seems to have been the result of a committee decision about 1978 where there was a real effort to find a usable repository site near the test site. Uh, just as there were efforts to find uh, a site like that near the Hanford facility, and there actually was serious consideration of some of the basalt uh, uh, formations in Idaho as well. Um, so, about 74, 75, 76, there were a group of people both at the DOE Nevada office, but also, uh, I guess actually at some point it transitions to DOE, but uh, before 76 was the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, working with people in Washington who were in the predecessor agency to DME, which was uh, ERDA, the Energy Research and Development Administration, they had a repository project. So they, they weren't just looking in Nevada, they were looking everywhere. I mean, they, they actually had caused a lot of concern in the Midwest uh, with the uh, basically secret government studies. You know, you're always talking about the secret federal studies. Yes, they were. They were looking at all kinds of places and not talking to the state officials in the affected states. They were, then they, there were some well-known sites uh, that, that were publicly disclosed, but uh, the long and the short of it is the earliest serious consideration of Yucca Mountain seems to be 1978, 1979. So then by the time that the uh, nuclear Waste uh, Policy Act is passed in 82. Um, there are people thinking about Yucca Mountain as a preferred site. Also, we should mention about that time, um, there were other things going on uh, at the test site. Um, there was a facility called uh, EMAD, the uh, Engine Maintenance and Disassembly Facility, which had been used for a number of projects, including looking at uh, nuclear fuel aircraft and rockets. Then there also uh, was a demonstration project at uh, a place called uh, Climax Ridge, where there was an old granite mine in, in, uh, in the Climax Ridge that 
um, actually was turned into a demonstration facility and real radioactive spent fuel from the Turkey Point reactor in Florida was brought there. They, I, have a, I keep a picture of it in my office. They had a whole mock-up of what a drift would look like with a machine that would go on a rail rack. In this case, they were using what's called a vertical borehole replacement, where in the floor of the tunnel, uh, a borehole is drilled and the machine drops a canister assembly, and this can all be done remotely to uh, protect the workers from the radiation. So there were a number of nuclear fuel, spent nuclear fuel research projects being done uh, in Nevada throughout the whole decade in the 70s. So it's not like uh, somebody out in the blue said, you know, this is a place. That and this is also the way that the, uh, the, the Hanford site was considered. They had a similar installation, a mock-up on the inside of a repository in a place called Gable Mountain. So, uh, but again, 78, it's actually a latecomer among some of the sites. Some of the other first round sites had been identified uh, as, as early as 76. And when I say they were secret, the very first thing I dealt with when I started working for the uh, energy office in Wisconsin uh, was the fact that a draft DOE environmental impact statement came out that had composite mock-ups of sites for repositories without identifying any of the sites that they had been studying. And so we sat down with a team and we, we looked at the animal inventories, the plant inventories, uh, climatic data, then we can finally figure out exactly which counties in Wisconsin and Minnesota they were looking at. And so this is from the very beginning, just as there was distrust in Nevada because of the above ground testing, uh, there was a heritage of distress really with all the DOE nuclear waste siting all across the country. Um, 1978. I would add also that I don't think it's an accident that Yucca Mountain, the selection in 1987, was an accident. It's on a, you know, a huge swath of public land owned by the federal government. And there's a certain uh, view that the test site was essentially a sacrifice zone. And again, we had no political power to come. Was there a Economic advantage for Nevada to have a repository. Well, I, I would just say, and I would certainly defer to Bob on this. Um, what one Congress says that the federal commitment is is not necessarily uh, adhered to by a later Congress, and we've seen sort of a deadlocking of Congress now for several years. So. There's, there's more to the story, obviously. Well, on, on the one hand, we've done a lot of research on economic impacts, positive and negative. How would the repository affect uh, perceptions of Las Vegas, in particular, as a tourism destination? More importantly, I think, as an investment location. Um, the, the, the problem with all of this is that if you talk about economic benefits before you have done the safety evaluation, it's impossible not to bias the safety evaluation. So the position that Nevada has is we're not interested in talking about economic benefits. We believe this is unsafe, and that's that's our position. You will hear an argument next week, and I'm sure it will be in the press, because when somebody like Representative Shimkus comes to talk to the Chamber of Commerce, you can know they've written up in pieces in the newspapers, and they've lined up interview slots on TV. Uh, you'll hear that they're going to give uh, X dollars per year to Nevada to the sign a preliminary agreement, you'll hear they're going to give us uh, 10 or 20 times that X. The first year that nuclear waste is received at Yucca Mountain, and that for years thereafter while operations are going on, um, they'll go back to giving some X number per year. Um, the difficulty, as Marta says, is that um, 
it's really hard to it's hard to require the federal government to live up to any kind of an agreement, particularly because now that we're having so many early reactor shutdowns, the amount of money that's going to come into the nuclear waste fund is going to go down. We actually look at this over a 120 year period, and before this last period of shutdowns, like what, San Onofre and uh, Oyster Creek and uh, some of the more recent reactor shutdowns that one anticipated, we were thinking that the amount of money coming into the nuclear waste fund was going to start going down dangerously in 2040. Now that time period has moved up to 2030. So, A, it's a problem of whether government commitments could even be relied upon, but B, it's now looking like there won't be enough money coming into the fund because the amount of money that comes in is based on an annual fee that reflects how many kilowatt hours of electricity we're generating. You know, one, one tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour, one mill, uh, is collected from the ratepayers by the utilities and goes into a fund. But that fee collection has been suspended for, I think, almost four years by a federal court decision. So that, there's not any, Nevada's answer is we're not interested in talking about economic benefits because we don't think it's safe. But for those people who do want to pursue economic benefits, there are some real complications in figuring out about whether any deals they made actually could be lived up to or will be lived up to. A couple of questions about uh, the legal process. Uh, what happens if Congress mandates a shortened hearing process? Or can Congress do that? Well, certainly that's an issue in earlier iterations of the Shinkus bill. Uh, and again, we anticipate that there's a likelihood of it passing in the House, but not necessarily in the Senate. Um, certainly, Congress has wide latitude to short-circuit a process, um, whether they can get it done. Anything substantive has to take 60 votes in the U.S. Senate. And um, so far, they have been able to get that done. But they're, cer they're certainly thinking of it. And uh, in earlier iterations of the bill that, we, that Bob mentioned, uh, there was certainly a language which would have completely eclipsed Nevada's water rights statutes, our administration of various EPA programs, including the Clean Air Program. There's certainly a lot that Congress can do. The statutory limit on waste that can go into Yucca Mountain now is 70,000 metric tons. In the Shimkus bill, they would raise it to 110,000. And uh, Congress can do it if Congress can get its act together. But I think that second if is pretty large right now. Okay, and then uh, the last case I mentioned, the Texas case, which we had quite a bit of controversy among our team, because to me it looked like pure junk. The te many states, including South Carolina and Washington, have been very active in trying to force the economic program forward. Uh, Texas, although it does have active reactors, has basically been on the sidelines, did not seek to participate in the early stages of licensing, has really been silent until lo and behold, uh, Rick Perry became Secretary of Energy. And a lawsuit was filed challenging two elements, one administered by the Department of Energy and one administered by the NRC, uh, both of which, to my humble, in my humble opinion, really don't hold water. But we did uh, intervene in that case. We're trying to get it dismissed. The uh, sort of guts of it is DOE had no authority to pursue consent-based siting, even though it didn't apply to Yucca Mountain. And the second part was that the NRC did not comply with the District of Columbia court order. And we think, uh, although we certainly have our disagreements with the NRC, we definitely feel that they've done a commendable job dealing with the 
expenditure of your work funds. So. Right, and going back to the whole notion of expediting, that's one thing that the Texas case would seek to do is expedite the process. Uh, whether they state a legal claim or not is I think you touched on this as well uh, in your later comments, but why was the NRC not allowed to have that great document? Why was the NRC not, didn't go on to really evaluate Yucca Mountain? Well, you know, I, I, I think one of the clear reasons is that um, Senator Reed, who was forced to deal with this situation in 1987, I mean, I'll tell you how bad this, this was in terms of what people did to Nevada. Um, Senator Proxmire felt so bad about Nevada being screwed he actually said to his chief of staff, that Harry Reid is such a nice young man, remember it's 1987, isn't there something we can do for him? But in fact, they couldn't figure out anything that could be done. This was power politics. It took Senator Reid decades to get in a position of power where he was then able to do some of the same parliamentary maneuvers to protect that. And he did this as majority leader and then as minority leader by gradually every year reducing the funding for the Yucca Mountain project at DOE and the licensing proceeding at the NRC. And so by the time, let's see, I guess I guess it was September 30th of 2011. Is that working here? Is that the last the last day of the fiscal year? Um, the NRC realized that Senator Reid had succeeded in cutting off the money for this and that they had no alternative but to vote to uh, suspend the proceeding. So that's, that's how it happened. Um, would Yucca Mountain shipments pass uh, through or by uh, monuments like Gold Butte? And was that one of the reasons we are trying to reduce the size? Well, the, um, the proposed Caliani corridor would actually uh, could actually actually impact the Basin Range National Monument, which isn't on uh, Secretary Zinke's cut list. And I would suggest that it's uh, really driven more by extractive industry and uh, other types of political cons concerns. And whether or not, as I understand it from wilderness people in Nevada, uh, the part that's going to be shaved or proposed for, to be shaved of the Gold Butte uh, is actually kind of a minor part under that uh, recommendation as it exists now. I have a few uh, geologically-oriented questions. Uh, why salt? Why would you want to use salt as a... Well, there are good and bad things. First thing to remember is there's no free lunch in the geologic disposal business. <laughs> every rock type has pros and cons, and every specific site has pros and cons. The, the, as Marta says, because it's dry, yes, the fact that the salt beds have been dry for, in some cases, hundreds of millions of years is one of the reasons they're attractive. They're also the, the areas that were looked at were, were geologically stable in the sense that they don't have size, significant seismic hazards and don't have uh, young volcano presence. By the way, when we talk about young volcanoes, we mean like 80,000 years. So when you've got a 1 million year performance standard, you look at a site like Yucca Mountain differently than you would at a salt site or a granite site where it's a 10,000 year performance uh, criteria because the, the spent fuel is under the water table and you're basically concerned about future inadvertent human intrusion as the way that the radiated lights get out of the repository. So with salt, right, uh, my recollection is that but the oil, the oil and gas, you know, there are a lot of oil and gas 
deposits associated with both bedded and gum salts. And so one of the downsides with salt is, uh, in fact, this is what did in the Lyons, Kansas site when they realized there had been a lot of exploratory drilling in the area that uh, where Brigham drilling would be allowed. A uh, positive thing about salt when it says it, it, it's, uh, uh, it's deformation when the heat of the waste is put into it is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it seals the waste away. It's a bad thing if you have to go in and try and retrieve the waste. So, uh, well, I think there's also a concern about um, how the very hot, high level waste performs in a salt formation. I think a lot of the assumptions were uh, focused on lower. That was the issue with width, right? When right. They decided not to go right. The Although this uh, interim site is near the salt formation, too. Yeah, but, that, but it would be on the and, and I think I'm a lay person, I'm an English major, so I'm hardly a scientist. But, uh, Having worked in this program many years, I think uh, one of the good things about a surface facility is you can, if there's a problem, you can see it. And you can also monitor uh, for radiation levels around it. So you'd be in a better position to rectify the problem. Yeah, I need to say that the peculiar name of the facility in New Mexico, Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, it was originally planned as a pilot facility to demonstrate how high level waste would affect the creep rate and the deformation of the salt and the calculations that they did convinced them that it was a bad thing to do a pilot plant that way because there was no guarantee uh, that they would be able to actually retrieve the high level waste forms from salt. And so that's why this project that was originally planned for high level waste ended up being used for transuranic waste, which like high level waste has very long lived isotopes like plutonium, uh, uh, neptunium, uh, things that have to be you know, kept away from the environment for uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of years, but that waste doesn't generate heat the way that spent fuel or vitrified high-level waste does. Oh, um, come on. Alan, people. we have about 10 minutes. Okay. So let's we'll see how well, you got there. Okay. <laughs> we, talked, we talked about this a little bit. I um, had a couple people wanting to know where are their uh, safe sites. Um, some, one question more specifically for Nevada, but for also more broadly for the, the nation as a whole, where would you go? Well, there's, there's nothing that makes you unpopular like talking about the sites you worked on years ago. I mean, I can tell you right off that some of the top granite geologists in the country, including Dr. Buzz Ostrom, who was the state geologist in Wisconsin, he was also the chairman of the peer review for all of the repository studies that were done in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and he was personally okay from a technical standpoint with the granite sites in Wisconsin being considered. It was distrust of the Department of Energy that led Wisconsin to lead this fight to change the law. I, I mean, so I can tell you, uh, undifferentiated granites number six near Thief River Falls Minnesota, the uh, Puritan Batholith in northwestern Wisconsin, the Wolf River Batholith in north central uh, Wisconsin, and I'm trying to remember the name of the formation in northern Maine, which looked pretty good, but the complication there was proximity to a Native American reservation and the tribe had off site uh, uh, hunting and gathering rights. And, and generally speaking, what we've learned is it's a really good idea to avoid Native American lands because the complexity now of Indian nation sovereignty added into the mix of other legal issues is very hard. Um, I would expect salt sites in the Permian Basin, the 
which is New Mexico and Texas, near where the lift facility is. That's, suppose you the mountain was on the table. Where, where would the U.S. look at closely? I think first we would look at those granite sites. Secondly, we would look at the salt site. Um, there actually were a couple of attractive salt domes in Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, sometimes you can't make these stories up. Uh, governor Edwards in Louisiana, who was the only repository state governor that I know of who ended up going to jail, uh, before he went to jail, successfully negotiated an agreement where in exchange for taking the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which one would think would be a positive, he got seven things in exchange from DOE, and one of them was that the Vachery Dome, which looked like a pretty good site from post-closure project, was taken off the list. And similarly, when Trent Locke was a minority whip in, in Mississippi, the story I'm told is he had a family member who lived in the town of Ripton, which is right over the Ripton Dome, which was considered, again, for post-closure, how does it operate for thousands of years? Uh, he got them off the hook. And interestingly, in, in the year 2000, by one vote, a veto that President Clinton did of a bill very much like the bill that Representative Shimkus is promoting, it was vetoed by President Clinton, and it survived. I mean, it, uh, the override was uh, was failed because. One person voted with the people that Senator Reid and Senator Bryan ran it. That person was Trent Watt of Mississippi. Okay. So, so, I mean, these politics, unfortunately, have been a driving caser. I would argue that Yucca Mountain is not the worst site, but I don't think it's in, it, it would not be in my top 10 because of the post-closure issues. But I'm one of those people, and we might as well say it now, in 1987, I helped wrangle up the votes, I helped write provisions that ended up in the, in, in the Waste Policy Amendments Act. I, I wrote a very influential conference paper on how many repositories were needed. It argued we only needed one repository, and gee, that should be in the West. And then other people in the West got around to pushing the up and down. So here are the four things that we thought we knew that we turned out we didn't know. No. One, Yucca Mountains on federal land, surrounded by federal land, um, that's a lot easier than taking away somebody's dairy farm in, in uh, Forest County, Wisconsin, which is where there's a real, actually it's under a big potato farm. It's the site that I thought would be the one. So first of all, government land. Well, we now find out it's not so easy take the bombing ranges, and uh, particularly now that they're doing full-size aircraft drones away from uh, uh, Creech Air Force Base, which is just down the road at Indian Springs. Second thing we thought is, well, there's the contamination from the test site. Nobody in Nevada in their right mind is going to say we can't have Yucca Mountain. In fact, it turns out that they're separate hydrologic basins. So, the water that's contaminated, that Marta has been involved in some of the cases monitoring, none of that goes into Amargosa Valley. So in fact, while there was maybe an issue that Nevada had accepted really bad nuclear stuff like above ground tests, it turns out <coughs> it's not, and then third, it's in the desert, so there won't be any problem with groundwater. My gosh, 30 years ago, we got totally wrong because of particularly the way the Amargosa River and the Federal stream known as 40 Mile Wash, all of a sudden, 30 years later, it doesn't look so smart. Finally, said there are no Indian tribes with rights to this site. And of course, nobody had looked hard, and now it turns out that the Timbush or Shoshone tribe is going to be a full legal participant in this proceeding, which is really going to complicate it. So it wasn't just a screw Nevada effort. While that was a big part of it, I will tell you, I helped. I helped as a political operative and a political analyst make those things happen. But there was ignorance about what the real licensing issues would be at Yucca Mountain. And one of the general things we've learned is 
right? The more you study a site, the easier it is to show that it doesn't meet the licensing criteria. And so that's why before we do something we do next, we've got to completely rework the licensing criteria before we, you know, start looking at uh, sites under somebody's potato field or sites near somebody's uh, wheat field in Texas or where somebody wants to drill for oil and gas in Utah. Well, finish maybe with a, a yeah. couple of hazard questions, very different ones. One is uh, seismicity and uh, concern at Yucca Mountain, and two, what if Kim Jong-un decides to drop a bomb on Yucca Mountain? Well, the, the main thing with the seismicity is that, Mario, you can address this, the state made a decision back in 2008 because we had limited resources that we could not tackle all the technical issues that we were concerned about. And we have lived to regret not doing more expert work on the seismic hazard issue at Yucca Mountain. So I can tell you all kinds of things that bother me, but in terms of licensing, the barn door is close on that. So we can't really raise any new earthquake hazard issues. And as far as an attack, um, you know, I, I, I think if that happens, we'll be worried about more things. Actually, the one good thing I can tell you is if it happens after closure, I'm not too worried about it. But if it happens during the pre-closure period, where you have spent nuclear fuel at the surface in large hot cells or in pools, you have the same concern that has been documented, documented uh, for conventional weapons attacks even on reprocessing facilities. And that, that's one of the problems with the processing screen, is that even a conventional weapon can then disperse an enormous amount of fission products. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but, but the, 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 the nuclear attack would be a big concern if there was spent fuel and high level waste in the sur surface facilities waiting to be put underground. But the truth is, once it got put underground, that's one of the things you don't have to worry about. Okay, thank you very much.